The truth is always an insult or a joke, lies are generally tastier. We love them. The nature of lies is to please. Truth has no concern for anyone's comfort. Defining men as the perpetrators of all violence is a viciously immoral judgment of an entire gender. And defining women as inherently nonviolent condemns as to the equally restrictive role of sweet, meek, and weak. Can you be happy with the movies, and the ads, and the clothes in the stores, and the doctors, and the eyes as you walk down the street all telling you there is something wrong with you? No, you cannot be happy. Because, you poor darling baby, you believe them. I do not plan any painting, but begin with layers of textures and colors. As I layer the colors, something is suggested to me from within, and that is how it evolves. There are parts of Texas where a fly lives 10,000 years and a man can't die soon enough. Time gets strange there from too much sky, too many miles from crack to crease in the flat surface of the land. Prior to penicillin and medical research, death was an everyday occurrence. It was intimate. Well, it arose out of two long-term concerns, the first being the possibility of genetic manipulation, nature versus nurture, what constitutes how people get to be how they are. In our struggle to restrain the violence and contain the damage, we tend to forget that the human capacity for aggression is more than a monstrous defect, that it is also a crucial survival tool. It is, I suppose, the common grief of children at having to protect their parents from reality. It is bitter for the young to see what awful innocence adults grow into, that terrible vulnerability that must be sheltered from the rodent mire of childhood. They thought to use and shame me but I win out by nature, because a true freak cannot be made. A true freak must be born. How deep and sticky is the darkness of childhood, how rigid the blades of infant evil, which is unadulterated, unrestrained by the convenient cushions of age and its civilizing anesthesia. Then there are those who feel their own strangeness and are terrified by it. They struggle toward normalcy. They suffer to exactly that degree that they are unable to appear normal to others, or to convince themselves that their aberration does not exist. These are true freaks, who appear, almost always, conventional and dull. In the end I would always pull up with a sense of glory, that loving is the strong side. It's feeble to be an object. What's the point of being loved in return, I'd ask myself. I get glimpses of the horror of normalcy. Each of these innocents on the street is engulfed by a terror of their own ordinariness. They would do anything to be unique. Only a lunatic would want to be president. These lunatics are created deliberately by those who wish to be presided over. You've seen it a thousand times. We create a leader by locating one in the crowd who is standing up. This may well be because there are no chairs or because his knees are fused by arthritis. It doesn't matter. We designate this victim as a stand-up guy by the simple expedient of sitting down around him. A-R-T-U-R-I-S-M. He must love me, I thought, amazed. A faint whiff of nausea hit me at seeing pain as proof of love, but it seemed true. Unavoidable. Grown-ups can deal with scraped knees, dropped ice cream cones, and lost dollies, but if they suspected the real reasons we cry they would fling us out of their arms in horrified revulsion. Yet we are small and as terrified as we are terrifying in our ferocious appetites. I have been a believer in the magic of language since at a very early age, I discovered that some words got me into trouble and others got me out. I don't mind being lord of all I survey but I don't want to have to work at it. It just wouldn't be practical. This idea that males are physically aggressive and females are not has distinct drawbacks for both sexes. 
Just being visible is my biggest confession, so they try to set me at ease by revealing our equality, by dragging out their own less apparent deformities. And while national military forces have historically resisted the full participation of women soldiers, female talent has found plenty of scope in revolutionary and terrorist groups around the planet. Perhaps the strongest evidence that women have as broad and deep a capacity for physical aggression as men is anecdotal. And as with men, this capacity has expressed itself in acts from the brave to the brutal, the selfless to the senseless. Light colors or a spring tree against that kind of blue sky that pulls your heart out through your eyes. Pretty things will swarm you like that, like your heart was a hive of electric bees. What I think happens, and that you have to acknowledge though, is that a director uses a book as a launching pad for his own work and that's always very flattering. The more potent, unasked question is how society at large reacts to eager, voluntary violence by females, and to the growing evidence that women can be just as aggressive as men. Most people seem to turn off at some point in their lives. Maybe it's 30 or 40. For most people it's lots younger. They stop there. Stop growing or changing or learning or something. From that point on they're dead. The more people we exclude, the more people will want to join. That's what exclusive means. The hope you get from religion is a three ring, all star hope because the risk is outrageous. I think that it's really important to go away and come back. But I think everybody should write. I think those people with stories who don't write should be stomped on. You just want to know that you're all right. You just want to feel all right. And now he dives into the sneer. Artie's sneer could flay a rhino. That's all you need other people's love for. Catherine Karen Dunn October 24, 1945 to May 11, 2016 in Garden City, Kansas, she was the second youngest of five siblings, her father left before she was two. Her mother, Velma Gali, an artist from North Dakota, married a mechanic -er and fisherman from the Pacific Northwest. The family moved often during her childhood. She went to high school in Tigard, Oregon, and later attended Reed College in Portland on a full scholarship, but never graduated. She suffered a difficult childhood due to poverty and a violent mother. She left home for good when she was 17. Poverty was an important element in her novels as well. In college she majored in philosophy and then psychology. Dunn was an American novelist, journalist, voice artist, radio personality, book reviewer, and poet from Portland, Oregon. She is best known for her novel Geek Love 1989. She was also a prolific writer on boxing.